Mr. President, honored delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we shall propose further cooperative efforts between all the nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. Remarks the President to the National Academy of Science from Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., October 22, 1963. And third, there is the atmosphere itself, the atmosphere in which we live and breathe and which makes life on this planet possible. Scientists have studied the atmosphere for many decades, but its problems continue to defy us. The reasons for our limited progress are obvious. Weather cannot be easily reproduced and observed in the laboratory. It must therefore be studied in all of its violence, wherever it has its way. Here is an oceanography. New scientific tools have become available with modern computers, rockets, and satellites. The time is ripe to harness a variety of disciplines for a concerted attack. And even more than oceanography, the atmospheric sciences require worldwide observation and hence international cooperation. Some of our most successful international efforts have involved the study of the atmosphere. We all know that the World Meteorological Organization has been effective in this field. It is now developing a worldwide weather system to which nations the world over can make their contribution. Such cooperative undertakings can challenge the world's best efforts for decades to come. And fourth, I would mention a problem which I know has greatly concerned many of you. That is our responsibility to control the effects of our own scientific experiments. For as science investigates the natural environment, it also modifies it. And that modification may have incalculable consequences for evil as well as for good. In the past, the problem of conservation has been mainly the problem of human waste, of natural resources, of their destruction. But science has the power for the first time in history now to undertake experiments with premeditation which can irreversibly alter our biological and physical environment on a global scale. The problem is difficult because it is hard to know in advance whether the cumulative effects of a particular experiment will help or harm mankind. In the case of nuclear testing, the world is satisfied that radioactive contamination involves unnecessary risks, and we are all heartened that more than 100 nations have joined to outlaw testing in environments where the effects most directly threaten mankind. In other fields, we may be less sure. We must, for example, balance the gains of weather modification against the hazards of protracted drought or storm. The government has the clear responsibility to weigh the importance of large-scale experiments to the advance of knowledge or to national security against the possibility of adverse and destructive effects. The scientific community must assist the government in arriving at rational judgments and interpreting these issues to the public. To deal with this problem, we have worked out formal procedures within the government to assure expert review before potentially risky experiments are undertaking. And we will make every effort to publish the data needed to permit open examination and discussion of proposed experiments by the scientific community before they are authorized. If science is to press ahead in the four fields that I have mentioned, if it is to continue to grow in effectiveness and productivity, our society must provide scientific inquiry the necessary means of sustenance. We must, in short, support it. Military and space needs, for example, offer little justification for much work in what Joseph Henry called abstract science. Though such fundamental inquiry is essential to the future technological vitality of industry and government alike, it is usually more difficult to comprehend than applied activity and as a consequence, often seems harder to justify to the Congress, to the executive branch, and to the people. But if basic research is to be properly regarded, it must be better understood. 
I ask you to reflect on this problem and on the means by which in the years to come our society can assure continuing backing to fundamental research in the life sciences, the physical sciences, the social sciences, on natural resources, on agriculture, on protection against pollution and erosion. Together the scientific community, the government, industry, and education must work out the way to nourish American science in all its power and vitality. Even this year, we have already seen in the first uh, actions of the House of Representatives some uh, failure of support for uh, important areas of research which must depend on the national government. I think it's, I'm hopeful that uh, the Senate of the United States will restore these funds. What it needs, of course, is a wider understanding by the country as a whole of the value of this work, which has been uh, so sustained by so many of you. I would not close, however, on a gloomy note. For ours is a century of scientific conquest and scientific triumph. If scientific discovery has not been an unalloyed blessing, if it has only conferred on mankind the power, it has only conferred on mankind the power not only to create, but also to annihilate, it has at the same time provided humanity with a supreme challenge and a supreme testing. If the challenge and the testing are too much for humanity, then we're all doomed. But I believe that the future can be bright and I believe it can be certain. Man is still the master of his own fate and I believe that the power of science and the responsibility of science have offered mankind a new opportunity not only for intellectual growth, but for moral discipline, not only for the acquisition of knowledge, but for the strengthening of our nerve and our will. We are bound to grope for a time as we grapple with problems without precedent in human history. But wisdom is the child of experience. In the years since man unlocked the power stored within the atom, the world has made progress, hauling, but effective, towards bringing that power under human control. It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather. And he who controls the weather will control the world. And ultimately, to control the weather, and he who controls the weather will control the world. And fourth, I would mention a problem which I know has greatly concerned many of you. That is our responsibility to control the effects of our own scientific experiments. For as science investigates the natural environment, it also modifies it. And that modification may have incalculable consequences for evil as well as for good. Tropical storm Harvey is pummeling southern We're live Texas. here in Houston, where Harvey's rains keep coming. It's not the initial impact, but the flooding. Record-shattering rain, massive flooding, families stranded. Waters keep rising. This is just the beginning. Hi, if anybody needs out there and can hear us, please help. I need a rescue. These are three kids, no food or water. Do we have anyone in the friendship area? Where's that friendship humble address area? at? What's the humble address where they're trying There's to let the There's been a report of another five foot of water about to pour out of Baker Dam. I-10 Dam. in Normandy, we need help. Families are going under with the we current. We need strong the boats. boats. Are I-10 in Normandy, families are on these boats. They, they, they need boats under. out there. At they I said a white truck went under the water. So and I'm like, well, it can't be him because he hid into my house. Also, I kept calling his wife, dialing 911, and no response. I kept calling Call him, no response. Hi ma'am, this is Texas Game Warden Carmen Rickle. It's my understanding that you guys have called to be evacuated from your residence, is that correct? Do you know the condition of the water around the house? I don't know. Stand by, we're going to try to get somebody out there to help you. I mean, lasers? Really? To change the weather? That's right. Well, as Mark Twain once famously said, everyone complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Well, instead of doing a rain dance, we physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. This is potentially a game changer. When you have water vapor and you have dust particles or 
ice crystals, you can precipitate rain. It condenses around the seeds. These seeds can also be created by laser beams. By firing trillion watt lasers, you rip apart the electrons, creating what are called ions, and these ions act like seeds, like dust particles, bringing down rain and even lightning. Any, go ahead. Well, I, I, this is fascinates me in part because, too, I remember reading the stories that China had used this during the Olympics, that the USSR had used this after Chernobyl to create rain clouds. Even in the 60s, the CIA used this to uh, bring down monsoons during the Vietnam War to wash out the Viet Cong.